Alrighty. So we're very, very happy to have John, uh, Jonathan Roth here with us to talk about his paper, um, Testing a Sensitivity Analysis for Violation of Parallel Trends. Um, and so John is a recent graduate of Harvard uh, in 2020 and is, I don't know if it's, if I should say, currently senior researcher and uh, in the Office of the Chief Economist at Microsoft and will be starting at uh, Brown as an AP in, uh, in this fall. So with that, I'll kick it over to you, John, and questions throughout are, are okay. And um, floor yours. Great. Uh, well, thanks everyone for having me here. Uh, so uh, this is going to be the combination of two papers, which I kind of loosely grouped together as tense, testing and sensitivity analysis for violations of parallel trends. Uh, and as Taylor said, uh, you know, please feel free to jump in whenever you have questions. So, uh, you know, as you all know, since you're in a reading group on difference and differences, uh, difference and differences and related methods uh, rely on uh, a so-called parallel trends assumption. Uh, and uh, if you're doing a different different practice, you're may often not be sure if the parallel trends assumption holds in your context. Uh, and so uh, there's developed a very common practice, which is if you're not sure about the validity of the parallel trends assumption, you test for pretrends, so test for the pretreatment analog to the parallel trends assumption, uh, and if that holds, that gives you a lot more confidence that it, you know, absent the treatment having happened, would have uh, parallel trends would have held in the post-treatment period. Uh, and so this is obviously a very uh, intuitive uh, practice, uh, but uh, it does have some limitations. And uh, so what I'm going to do in this talk today is I'm going to tell you uh, more about what those limitations are. Uh, and about what we can do about them. So uh, let me just start with a 30,000 foot overview and tell you in sort of three bullet points what I see as the limitations of the uh, approach of pretrends testing. Uh, so the first issue is that pretrends tests may have low power. So if we're only gonna, uh, you know, not proceed with our diff and diff approach if we don't find a uh, significant pretreatment violation of parallel trends. Well, in some cases, parallel trends may be violated, but we may not find a significant pretrend. Uh, so uh, that's obviously going to be a problem. Uh, the second issue is a somewhat more subtle issue, which uh, relates to statistical distortions from pretesting. Uh, so I'll talk about this uh, in more detail. But essentially, if we only analyze cases where we don't find a significant pretrend, uh, that's going to lead to some selection bias in terms of which draws of the data we actually look at. Uh, and that can create some additional statistical problems. Uh, and then the final problem uh, is well, suppose we do detect a significant pretrend. Well, we've diagnosed that there may be some problems with the parallel trends assumption, but uh, we're sort of in the business of writing papers. Uh, and so I guess, you know, we, we can give up entirely and say we can't learn anything from this context, but, uh, you know, often we don't want to do that. And then it's not clear under sort of the standard pretesting paradigm, what comes next if you uh, reject the pretest. Uh, so uh, those are sort of the, the three big limitations I'm going to talk about uh, in uh, the talk today. Uh, and then I'm going to try and answer the question, uh, sort of, what can we do about it? Uh, so I'm going to talk about two approaches uh, discussed in the, in the two papers that I mentioned. Uh, so the first is basically going to be to do some diagnostics to try and figure out, uh, you know, are we in a case where we think these limitations of pretesting are going to be uh, severe? Uh, so we can do diagnostics of power and we can analyze the likely distortions um, from pretesting under some user specified possible differences and trends that may be relevant in our context. Uh, and uh, the, the pretrends package that I've put together, uh, there's also a shiny app for this one, uh, will sort of help you to do these types of, of analyses. And then the second approach will be kind of a more formal sensitivity analysis, uh, which I proposed in this paper with uh, my co-author Ashesh, uh, and that uh, can be used uh, with the honest difference and differences package. Uh, and so uh, what I'm gonna do in my talk today is I'm gonna focus mainly on sort of uh, trying to make clear uh, what these limitations of pretrans testing are uh, and uh, talk about implementations of the solution. Uh, and I'm gonna be very light on kind of the econometric sausage of say how these you know robust confidence intervals are constructed, 
uh, and stuff like that. Uh, if you're interested in that, you know, you can read the papers and I'd be happy to, to talk if anyone has any questions about kind of how the econometrics works, but that's, that's not going to be my focus in the talk today. Cool. Uh, so let me just kind of jump straight into these issues with the uh, you know, common practice of, of pre-trans testing. Uh, so the first issue I, I'm going to talk about, as I mentioned, is uh, low power of the pretests. Uh, and I think this is most easily uh, sort of illustrated uh, with a simple example. And But I just want to highlight from the start that while I'm going to illustrate with an example to one paper, this is by no means meant to be a critique of this paper in particular. Uh, and in fact, I'll show you a little bit uh, evidence later on that these are kind of more systematic problems that you know I'm just highlighting here uh, with one example. So with that said, uh, the example I'm going to show you uh, is a paper by uh, Hat and Wong. Uh, and they study the impacts of a program that places college graduates as village officials uh, in uh, rural villages in China. Uh, and so they're going to use a pretty standard uh, event study approach uh, that's intuitively trying to compare treated uh, and untreated villages. Uh, so uh, in particular, they're, they're plotting uh, in this plot I've shown here a two-way fixed effects regression where the outcome uh, is, um, is uh, I think here is the number uh, or the fraction of the population that receives subsidies from the federal government. Then we regress this outcome on indicators for time since treatment uh, and uh, fixed effects for units uh, and times. Since you had Andrew Goodman Bacon out uh, earlier uh, in, in your reading group, you might know that you know if there's a lot of treatment effect heterogeneity, then this type of, of specification may have its own problems, even if parallel trends holds. Uh, but suppose for now that you know we were willing to assume homogeneous treatment effects at given event times, so that, that that's not an issue uh, under parallel trends. Um, so uh, they, you know, take, estimate this regression and they plot these coefficients in this event study, uh, which is, you know, sort of a fairly a standard looking plot where these three pretreatment coefficients correspond with the, the leads of treatment and the, and the four post-treatment coefficient corresponds with the lags. The period minus one is, is normalized to zero here. So uh, one of the reasons that I chose this paper uh, as kind of a leading example, it has this great quote, which I think is a nice summary of what is sort of the status quo standard practice uh, when looking at these types of plots. Uh, so they write the estimated coefficients on the leads of treatment. So these three coefficients here are statistically indifferent from zero. And we therefore conclude that the pretreatment trends in the outcomes in both groups of villages are similar. And so therefore villages without the treatment can serve as a suitable control group for villages with the treatment in the treatment period. So basically they're looking at these pretreatment coefficients. They can't reject that they're all equal to zero. And so we're gonna sort of take that as validation of the parallel trends assumption, and then assume that these are all kind of valid estimates of the post-treatment treatment effect uh, for this treatment of interest. So I think just to put a little bit of statistical structure on the argument that I think you know, he and Wong are making and the argument that's commonly made in this literature. So basically they're saying is you know, we have estimates of the pretreatment uh, difference in differences. And uh, we think under parallel trends that uh, in fact, these true coefficients that we're estimating are all equal to zero. So the true coefficients are actually equal to these green dots. Uh, and we can't rule out that our estimated coefficient, these triangles are actually equal to these green dots. And indeed, if we ran a formal F test for this hypothesis that these uh, estimated you know, coefficients are actually, the true coefficient is actually these green dots, we wouldn't reject at any conventional level. So we'd get a p-value of 0 0.81. So that's kind of the, the argument that underlies uh, this uh, standard practice. So the pretreatment parallel trends is plausible in this context. We can't reject it uh, statistically. Uh, but the reason this is a bit of an unsatisfying argument uh, is I've now here drawn uh, three uh, other dots, the red dots. Sorry if anyone is colorblind. I should probably change the, the coloring in this graph. But you see these three red dots here. Uh, and uh, if we tested the hypothesis that these uh, estimated coefficients are actually equal to the red dots, then we would also get a p-value of uh, 0 0.81. Uh, I, of course, you know, drew the red dots exactly so we would get the same p-value. Uh, 
Uh, but what's kind of concerning about this is that uh, these red dots uh, are drawn such that they're on a straight line, uh, such that if we extrapolated this straight line, so we thought that this pretrend uh, would continue, we get biases uh, sort of out here that are of a similar magnitude as our estimated post-treatment coefficients. So if the true trend were just kind of a straight line with this slope, uh, we also wouldn't reject, uh, you know, we, we also can't reject that that, that is actually the, the true pretreatment uh, trend, uh, but that would be kind of a concerning trend for us if we thought the trend could continue linearly. Likewise, I can draw another three dots, the, the blue dots here. Uh, again, these are constructed so that we get a p-value of 0 0.81. Uh, and these ones happen to be lie on sort of a smooth quadratic curve that if we continued extrapolating that, uh, we would get uh, a sort of negative bias of a similar magnitude to the estimated coefficient. So if this were the true trend, you know, we can't really rule that out uh, either, uh, but this would produce negative bias such that these estimates would be way too small. Uh, so what I want you to take away from this is it's true, we can't reject a zero pretrend, but it's also true that we can't reject other non-zero pretrends that under, you know, seemingly reasonable smooth extrapolations to the post-treatment period would produce a substantial bias in our treatment effects estimates. Um, so uh, this, as I mentioned, is kind of not the only paper that seems to have this problem. Uh, so uh, in uh, my uh, one of my papers, uh, this should now, I guess, say 2021, because I just put out a new draft of this paper. Uh, but uh, in my uh, pretest with caution paper, uh, I do sort of a more systematic version of this type of exercise. Uh, so I do this systematic survey of uh, papers published uh, in the AER and AEJ journals. Uh, and I sort of do systematic uh, you know, power calculations for uh, the event plots uh, in these papers. Uh, and you can kind of, you know, see the results uh, in the paper if you're interested. But uh, in essence, they suggest that this type of issue where the power uh, of pretrends tests is low against trends that could produce a, stamp, a bias of a magnitude that's, you know, somewhat comparable to the estimated treatment effects. This is sort of not a, a, a particularly rare situation for the He and Wong example that I showed you and, and sort of is, is a somewhat more pervasive issue. So I, I won't go into the details of exactly the simulation design and all the results, uh, but they're kind of there in the paper uh, if you're interested in checking them out. Uh, any questions so far? Cool. Great. Um, so uh, that was the uh, first issue, uh, the power of the pretest may be low. Uh, the second issue relates to uh, distortions uh, from pretesting. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, suppose parallel trends is actually violated. Uh, as I just told you, uh, because the pretest doesn't have perfect power, in some draws of the data, even if parallel trends is violated, we may not find a significant pretrend. Um, but the draws of the data where that happened are going to be a selected sample from the overall data generating process, right? We have to get a particular noise in a particular direction in order to not find the pretrend that's actually there. And so since we're going to be, if we're only going to analyze the treatment effects estimates when we don't find a significant pretrend, we're going to be estimate. We're going to be sort of analyzing a selected sample from the data generating process, uh, and this is going to introduce uh, sort of additional statistical issues, uh, which under certain conditions uh, will make these issues of low power uh, even worse. Uh, and so I'm going to illustrate this with a simple, uh, sorry, this should say a simple example rather than a sample example. Uh, I'm going to illustrate this with a, a simple uh, simulation example. Uh, and I'll sort of defer to my, my paper on this for kind of sort of more theoretical grounding uh, for these issues. Okay, uh, so let me describe to you uh, in one slide uh, sort of the simulation uh, design that I'm gonna show you, which is gonna be very stylized, but will hopefully sort of give you the intuition for why pretesting can uh, potentially make things worse. Uh, so we're gonna think about a, a, a stylized model where there are three time periods, minus one, zero, and one. Uh, 
And there's going to be some treatment group who receives treatment uh, before the last period. So we're going to have two pre-treatment uh, periods and one uh, post-treatment period. Uh, and for gonna, simplicity, we're going to think that there's no causal effect of the treatment. So the treated and the untreated potential outcomes are just the same uh, for everybody. Uh, but the treatment group is going to be on a linear pretrend relative to the control group. So for the control group, we're going to just have zero mean in all periods. And for the treatment group, uh, we're going to have uh, the mean of the outcome be on a, a linear trend with slope delta. And then we're going to think of the realized outcomes, uh, mean, meaning the, the average outcome for each uh, group is just going to be uh, their group mean plus some uh, independent normal error. So obviously, you know, errors are not going to be completely independent across time periods. This is very stylized, but hopefully we'll give you the idea of the intuition. So uh, in this simulation design, we're going to think about uh, the case where delta is three. Uh, so there is an upward pretrend. And basically on this graph, uh, the, uh, the y-axis is going to be represent the difference in means between the treatment group and the control group uh, in the relevant period. So in period minus one, the true population mean says that uh, the, the treatment group mean minus the control group mean is, is minus three uh, in period minus one, and then it's going to be zero uh, in uh, period zero, and it's going to be three uh, in period one. So we have this upward sloping pretrend. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, with a finite n, we don't always get uh, an exactly a straight line. Uh, so here in gray, I've plotted uh, a bunch of simulation draws uh, from this data generating process. You know, so sometimes the pre you know, the pretreatment difference in period minus one starts up here and then goes down here and then goes up there. Sometimes, you know, follows any one of these given gray paths. Um, and so, you know, sometimes we'll detect a significant pretreatment difference and sometimes we won't. Uh, and so what I've done here in, in uh, blue is I've highlighted the draws of the, the data from this data generating process where we don't detect a significant pretreatment difference between period minus one and period zero. So intuitively, uh, you know, the true trend is this upward sloping line. When do we not detect uh, the upward sloping line? Well, when we have noise that makes this difference between minus one and zero relatively flat. So you see here that these blue lines are relatively flat relative to the, the underlying trend, which is the black lines. Uh, and then these blue lines tend to be relatively uh, flat when we've underestimated the difference in trends, uh, sorry, the difference in means at period zero, right? So these blue dots here at period zero tend to be below the population mean of, of zero difference at period zero. So the dot, the blue dots here tend to be very low down. And that means that the, uh, the, the change between period zero and period one tends to be particularly large in these blue lines. So you see that these blue lines tend to have a particularly steep slope between period zero and period one. So if I just average this over very many draws, what I see here is that, you know, if I hadn't conditioned on the result of the pretest, of course, you know, over a million draws, I'd basically get back this straight line where there's a change in uh, of three between minus one and zero and a change of three between zero and one. But in these blue draws, well, I tend to get a much flatter slope in the pretreatment period here on average only 1.4. And I get a much steeper slope uh, in the post-treatment period here of 3.8. So if I just, just ignored the pretrends and kind of averaged over all these draws and looked at the post-treatment diff and diff, I would have a bias of three. But if I only look at these draws where I got an insignificant pretrend, uh, in this case, I'd get a post-treatment bias of 3.8. So I get a, you know, a larger bias in the draws of the data where I don't detect this significant pretrend. Any questions on that? Great. Uh, so that was issue number two. Uh, and then issue number three is, well, suppose we fail the pretest. So we do have enough power to detect a significant pretrend. So then what happens? Uh, so here is an example of something that's rare, which is someone publishes a paper where they show that they failed the, the pretrends test. Uh, so uh, 
this is a, a paper by Lovenheim and Willen that I'll, I'll talk more about towards the end of the talk when I, I do uh, the applications for my honest approach paper. Uh, but they study uh, the effects of uh, laws that strengthen teachers' unions. Uh, and they study the effects on the employment of male students and female students. And for female students, uh, they find the following uh, event plot graph where uh, we can't actually rule out that all these pretreatment coefficients are equal to zero. And just visually, they kind of look like they're on a, a downward sloping line. And so they write, uh, there is clear evidence of differential pretreatment trends uh, on this plot for women. And so our empirical approach does not appear valid for women, and therefore we cannot draw a strong conclusions. So, uh, you know, they basically say we detected a pretrend, and so we're kind of screwed. We can't really say anything for women, uh, and you know maybe that's right. But you know, as researchers, we might want to be able to learn something about uh, the effects of these duty to bargain laws on female employment, uh, and so it might maybe. Uh, useful to know under what assumptions about the ways parallel trends can be violated, may we be able to say something more definitive about female employment. Okay, so uh, those are the, the sort of three issues uh, I see with the common pass practice of testing for pre-existing trends. Uh, so uh, let me yeah. now, yep. Can I ask a question about the, the, like the first issue? That, mm -hmm. that you noted. So, so, so the problem with issue one is that the, like, that the, that the um, trend is too flat. Um, is, is that the problem? And that's like why the F test cannot detect it? Like, because the, the, like, the question that I have is, is why we cannot detect the pre-trend, but we are able to detect a statistically significant effect in the demonstration period. Like, wh wh what is the difference in the size of the, co of the coefficients or is, the, or is the, the line? What is the issue there? Yeah, so, the, I mean, the issue is that, you know, oftentimes or oftentimes the slope of the pretrend may not be sufficiently large relative to uh, the, you know, standard errors on the pretreatment coefficients such that, you know, with some positive probability, we don't detect a significant pretrend. Um, you raise a good point that it, like in some cases, we might think that, uh, well, if we don't detect significant here, then we also won't detect significant here. Um, but uh, so, I mean, and you know, that is true. Sometimes we won't detect a significant pretrend here. We also won't detect a significant pretrend here, but the confidence intervals here are basically valid under the assumption that we have no bias. So if you add in some bias, then uh, you know if we don't detect it here, we're you know more than uh, five percent of the time gonna have sort of a confidence interval here that doesn't cover the true treatment effect. Um, these symmetry arguments also break down a lot in uh, a case which is empirically fairly common when you have a few pretreatment periods but many post-treatment periods. So of course, you know, say. I only had one pretreatment period here. I only had this minus two. Well, that's going to be relatively hard to detect because this red dot is pretty close to zero. But if I go out to period 15 afterwards, this slope is going to continue, you know, assuming it's linear, that's going to be a, sort of a very large bias. Um, so these issues related to, to power, you may have very low power in the pretreatment period, particularly uh, if you have sort of very few pretreatment coefficients, and then if you have a long time horizon, those biases, you know, assuming some type of monotonicity, will accumulate over time. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Great. Uh, any other questions? Great. Um, so uh, let me now transition uh, into uh, the sort of solutions. Uh, portion of the talk. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about kind of two ways of uh, approaching these problems. Uh, the first is going to be probably simpler uh, and what I call a low touch intervention, but perhaps a little bit less theoretically satisfying. Uh, so let me first talk about that one and then I'll talk about kind of a, a more formal and, and comprehensive approach. Um, so the kind of low touch intervention I'm going to describe is basically to try to evaluate, well, what is 
the likely power of our pretests against relevant violations of parallel trends and what would the distortions from pretesting uh, look like uh, if we kind of think about violations of parallel trends that are relevant uh, in our context. Uh, and so uh, I've put together this R package called the pretrends package uh, along with an accompanying Shiny app that can kind of uh, help you do these types of calculations. So uh, let me just show you uh, what uh, the app does. Um, so basically what you do is you input the estimated uh, coefficients and their covariance matrix. Uh, so this is precisely the data from He and Wong that I showed you before uh, in uh, black. So the black dots are the coefficients and the, um, the, the bars are the uh, confidence intervals. Uh, and then you plug in a hypothesized uh, difference uh, in trends. Uh, and so that's what's plotted here uh, in red. So we can sort of visualize this upward sloping linear trend that's running through uh, these uh, confidence intervals. Uh, and then uh, the, an output of uh, this uh, package it is this dotted blue line, which tells you, well, if the true trend were these uh, red squares here, this straight line, the uh, dotted uh, blue triangle series shows you what would be the expected value of your coefficients conditional on not finding a significant pre-existing trend. Uh, so uh, this kind of like in the stylized simulation I showed you, conditional on not finding a significant pre-trend under this true trend, we sort of see a flatter uh, trend in the pretreatment period, and then a somewhat sleep, steeper uh, trend uh, in the post-treatment period. Um, so that's sort of one output of the package. The second output uh, is a series of uh, calculations related to uh, the power uh, of this pretest. Um, so uh, the first is uh, uh, what I just call power. Uh, so uh, this here, which in this example is 0 0.33. Uh, so what is that? Well, that's the chance given uh, your uh, covariance matrix, so the size of your standard errors, that you find a significant pretrend under the hypothesized difference in trends. So if the, the true difference in trends were uh, this uh, red line uh, denoted with the squares, what would be the chance that you would detect a significant pretrend? Well, uh, in this case, for that line that I drew, uh, this would be uh, 0 0.33. So with that red line, only a third of the time would we find a uh, significant pretrend. Uh, we also uh, report. Can I ask? Can I ask yeah. another question about that? Like, and sure. and what is typically your hypo, uh, hypothesized uh, uh, trend? Like, what do you have as hypothesis for your trend? Like, you you look at the data and see, oh, it looks like the, there is an upward trend here. Let me see if that could be detected. Is is that how you uh, enter the trend for the hypothesized trend? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, I mean, I think ideally uh, you would have some economic knowledge about the types of trends that you think might be relevant in your context. So, you know, I've drawn things linearly here. Linear may make sense kind of as a, uh, you know, baseline if you think there may be, you know, like long run secular changes between the, uh, the treatment and control groups that are relatively smoothly evolving over time. Um, on the other hand, if you were in a job training program context where you're worried about Ashenfelter's dip, where people enroll in the training program right after they have a negative shock, then by mean reversion, you'd expect their earnings to go up. Linear would be precisely the wrong thing to do. You'd kind of want to think about a process where it's increasing here and then decreasing here. Um, so, I mean, I think that the best way to do this is when there's some economic knowledge that motivates the types of differences in trends that we may be worried about. Um, but, uh, you know, absent some type of economic knowledge, something like a linear or quadratic sort of seems like, you know, a reasonable thing to do. Um, but I have a slide, a few slides ahead of sort of talking about, uh, you know, kind of limitations of this type of approach. And it, you sort of perfectly nailed one of them, which is it's not always entirely obvious what the kind of hypothesized trend should be. Any other questions?
Uh, so we've shown the power, you know, against that particularly chosen hypothesized trend. Uh, we'd only detected about a third of the time. So, you know, if you thought the bias from this trend was meaningful, that would be rather concerning. Uh, we also uh, report the Bayes factor. So what this is, is this is the relative chance that you'd pass the pretest under the hypothesis trend versus under parallel trends. So this is always going to be less than one, basically because you're most likely to pass the pretrend test under parallel trends. Uh, but in this case, this Bayes factor is relatively close to one. So the chance that we pass the pretest under this hypothesized trend is about three quarters of what it would be under parallel trends. And then the last thing we show is the likelihood ratio. So that says, given the observed pretrend coefficients, uh, what's the relative likelihood we would see pretrend coefficients like that under the hypothesis trend, under the hypothesized trend versus under parallel trends? So here for this example, this likelihood ratio is actually greater than one. So what that means is under this hypothesized trend, seeing uh, coefficients that uh, look like the ones that we actually observe are more likely under the hypothesis trend than under parallel trends. So um, let me just talk briefly about the, the pros and cons oh, hi, of this approach. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you go back to one slide? Uh, I, this might sound stupid to you, but is the base factor is like one minus the power? Uh, no. So it's um, it's okay. one okay. it's it's one minus the power of this test divided by one minus the power of the test under uh, parallel trends. Okay, so a slightly tricky thing about these pretrends tests is that it's common in practice that people test for individual statistical significance of the pretreatment coefficients. But since each of those has sort of size, uh, rejects with 5% probability, say for 95 confidence intervals, then the chance that you find one of them that's significant may be larger than 0 0.05. Uh, and so this is sort of accounting for the fact that even under parallel trends, you may find some significant pretreatment coefficient uh, sort of more than 5% of the time. Yep. Cool. Um, so uh, just to kind of recap some of the pros and cons, although Daniela's uh, comment kind of already uh, touched on this a little bit. Um, so uh, the pros of this are, I think it's very intuitive and kind of easy to visualize uh, these violations of parallel trends. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, this type of approach relative to the status quo will do a lot to help to identify when uh, sort of the pretesting approach may be least effective. So if we, you know, find that the pretest would have very low power against what we think are plausible violations of parallel trends that would produce bias of a very large magnitude, then, you know, we know that our pretest isn't being very effective. And so we shouldn't put much weight uh, on the pretest and kind of should think about whether we think uh, parallel trends is ex ante plausible. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's a big advantage. I also think an advantage of this approach is that it requires relatively minimal change from standard practice. So, you know, if you want to stick with what people have been doing and do something that you're familiar with, I think this is a simple diagnostic that helps you, you know, decide whether you think that, uh, you know, the problems that I've outlined are likely to be severe in your context or not. Um, but this approach is kind of not without a limitation. So let me talk a little bit about what the limitations are. So the first is that the power against any violation of parallel trends will basically always be less than one. So given any hypothesized difference in trends, there's some chance that you don't detect a significant pretrend. Uh, and so there's no guarantee, you know, formally from econometrics of unbiasedness or correct inference conditional on passing the pretest. So we haven't completely solved the problem, but we've maybe identified cases where we think it's not you know, too bad. Uh, the second, uh, which we talked about uh, a little bit in response to Daniela's uh, uh, comment, uh, is that you have to specify a hypothesized trend. Uh, it's not always obvious what the relevant hypothesis trend is. Uh, and it may sometimes be difficult to summarize over large classes of possible differences uh, in trends. Uh, and then the third thing is, uh, okay, we've you know determined the power of the pretest, but suppose the pretest rejects. You know, we have a significant pretrend. Well, it's still not obvious from this approach what to do when we reject the pretest. Any questions on this slide? Great. Uh, 
So uh, that kind of leads me to uh, the, the second approach uh, based on this uh, paper on honest approach to parallel trends with my co-author Ashesh. Uh, and so what we do in that paper is we say, well, suppose rather than uh, pre-testing, we were willing to place some restrictions on the way that parallel trends might be violated. Um, so in particular, the types of restrictions that we think about uh, formalize what we think is the logic motivating uh, these uh, pre-trends tests. Uh, so in particular, we think the logic of pre-trends testing is, well, the reason we're checking for pre-treatment differences in trends is that we think that these pre-treatment differences in trends are informative about the counterfactual post-treatment differences in trends. So to put this another way, uh, if we thought the pre-treatment difference in trends could be zero, but the post-treatment difference in trends could be large, then it wouldn't be very informative to check for pretrends because there could be a huge bias even if the true pretrend uh, is zero. Uh, and so the way we formalize this is we place restrictions on the relationship between the pretreatment trends and the counterfactual post-treatment trends. Uh, and then what we do is we derive confidence sets that are gonna be uniformly valid so long as the difference in trends satisfies the imposed restrictions. And then we're gonna recommend that researchers do sensitivity analysis where they show these confidence sets under different assumptions about how informative the pretreatment trends are for the counterfactual post-treatment trends. Uh, and that will let you do analysis to say, well, how much do we have to assume about how informative the pretreatment trends are uh, to learn something about uh, the treatment effect of interest. Okay. So uh, let me tell you a little bit more uh, about uh, how uh, this approach works. Uh, and to start out, uh, I'm gonna consider uh, a, a sort of simple three period diff and diff model, uh, similar to the one that I showed you earlier uh, for uh, those simulations illustrating uh, the uh, distortions from pretesting. Uh, so let me just first introduce some notation. So again, we're going to have uh, these three periods. Uh, and again, we're going to have a group that receives treatment uh, just before the last period, uh, which we'll denote by D equals one. Uh, and we're going to have a, a control population denoted by D equals zero that never gets the treatment. Uh, and we're going to observe an outcome uh, denoted YIT. Uh, for some panel of treated uh, and control units. Uh, and uh, we'll have a, a fairly standard uh, potential outcomes uh, framework. Uh, and then the target parameter is gonna be the average treatment effect on the treated uh, in uh, the period where treatment occurs. So we're gonna denote that by tau ATT. And that's the expectation of the difference between the treated potential outcomes uh, and the untreated potential outcomes. Uh, and one important assumption that we're going to make is that treatment has no effect before its implementation so that the treated and the untreated potential outcomes are exactly the same in periods before treatment occurs. Okay, uh, so uh, suppose in this context where we don't have any staggered treatment timing, uh, we estimate uh, this sort of common uh, event study coefficient where we regress y on unit and time fixed effects, and then interactions between uh, treatment status and uh, relative time, where we say normalize the period before treatment to zero. So uh, in this simple three period setting, we get these two coefficients beta hat one and beta hat minus one. And these are gonna be difference in differences of sample means. So beta hat one is gonna be the difference in the sample mean for the treated group in period one relative to the the treated group in period zero uh, difference relative to the equivalent change uh, for the control group. And likewise, beta hat minus one is gonna be a difference in difference of sample means, but comparing period minus one to zero rather than comparing period uh, one to zero. So uh, if we kind of do out our first year econometrics uh, problem set and we compute the expectation of beta hat one, we're gonna get that it's equal to our target parameter uh, plus a bias term delta one, where what is this bias term? It's just gonna be the expected difference in difference of untreated potential outcomes. Um, and so of course, beta hat one is gonna be biased for the ATT 
if this counterfactual difference uh, in trends is not equal to zero. So if delta one is not equal to zero. But unfortunately, we don't observe uh, delta one uh, directly. Uh, so we can't directly test whether we have bias. But the idea is that uh, we do observe a pre-period analog uh, to delta one, which is the expectation of beta hat minus one well, that's going to be the difference in differences of pretreatment of sure of untreated potential outcomes, but comparing period minus one to zero rather than comparing period one to zero. And the reason we don't have an ATT term here is that we've assumed that there's no anticipatory effect of treatment. So there's no causal effect of this treatment in period minus one. And the typical parallel trends assumption uh, is that uh, you know we have parallel trends in all periods so that delta minus one is equal to delta one, which is equal to zero. And we sort of test the, the testable part of this by saying, well, is delta minus one equal to zero? So uh, what we're gonna do here is something different, which is rather than uh, testing uh, uh, that delta minus one is equal to zero, we're gonna try to conduct inference on the tau ATT while relaxing the assumption that this counterfactual difference in trends delta one is exactly equal to zero. Of course, we can't leave delta one completely unrestricted because then the uh, treatment effects could be anything. Uh, in econometric speak, it's not identified. Um, but the intuition behind pretrends testing is that delta minus one is informative about delta one. So we check that delta minus one is equal to zero because we think that's informative about the size of delta one. Uh, and so we're going to formalize this by placing restrictions on the positive possible values of delta one, given uh, the value of delta minus one. So in particular, we're going to require that this vector delta, which is the pre-treatment and post-treatment difference in trends, falls in some set uh, large delta, where large delta is our possible differences in trends. And so then what we're gonna do is we're then gonna derive confidence sets that are valid for the ATT, so long as this restriction that little delta is in large delta holds. Uh, and such confidence sets are called honest uh, with respect to delta uh, in the statistics literature. So the phrase, an honest approach to parallel trends is kind of a play on words uh, with respect to this uh, criteria for our confidence intervals being valid so long as this restriction holds. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're rec going to recommend doing sensitivity analysis with respect to large uh, delta. So in particular, we're going to think about how our conclusions change under different assumptions about what violations of parallel trends we're willing to allow for ex ante. And in particular, how the post-treatment, possible post-treatment differences in trends relate to uh, the pre-treatment differences in trends. Any questions? Um, so you might be thinking, well, what types of restrictions on the relationship between the pretreatment differences in trends and the post-treatment differences in trends might we uh, make? Uh, so let me give you some uh, examples here. So the basic idea is suppose that we didn't have any estimation error in the, the pretreatment period. So suppose we knew delta minus one uh, exactly. Well, this restriction large delta is basically telling us, well, if we knew this delta minus one pretrends, what would that tell us about the counterfactual post-treatment difference delta one? So one assumption we can make is that the trends are exactly linear. So if you told me delta minus one, I could just draw a line, extrapolate that out, and I would learn delta one uh, by extrapolating this line. Uh, so uh, that would correspond uh, in this simple two period case as the delta where delta one is equal to minus delta minus one, right? So I'm just continuing this line. This of course is a very strong assumption, um, but it is actually uh, something that, that people rely on in practice. So in some cases where people are worried about parallel trends violations, they include a parametric linear trend, which of course is gonna be valid only if this parametric linear structure is exactly right. Um, but, you know, this parametric linear structure is imposing a lot and we may be interested in relaxing it. So one thing that we could do is to say, well, we think this linear 
structure may be a reasonable approximation, but it may not hold exactly. So instead of imposing that this linear extrapolation is exactly right, we're going to say that it's only approximately right so that it may be off by a uh, given factor, which we're going to call m here. Um, so we're going to call this, this uh, set delta sd of m. Uh, and the reason we're using uh, sd as an, as an abbreviation is we're basically uh, bounding uh, the uh, analog of the second derivative of this curve here. Right, so this is basically saying how much can the slope between period minus one and period zero uh, be different from the slope between period zero and period one. So that's sort of the second difference of this vector, or the discrete analog of the second derivative. Does that make sense? Uh, and this kind of logic extends to multiple periods easily by sort of restricting the change in slope or the second difference by m across consecutive periods. Um, this, of course, is just kind of one possibility of the types of things that we, types of restrictions we could place uh, on the possible differences in trends. Uh, so let me just highlight a few others that we kind of cover in the paper, uh, although I won't go into too much detail. Um, so uh, another type of restriction that you might impose uh, is that economic knowledge often implies uh, either restrictions on the sign of the trend or kind of on its shape. Uh, so for instance, sometimes we're worried about secular ongoing trends that we think aren't going to change direction, uh, in which case it may be reasonable to impose monotonicity of the, the difference in trends. Uh, in other cases, we know about simultaneous policy changes. Uh, say, you know, there's something that we think increases labor market earnings, so we may impose that the sign of the bias uh, in a particular period uh, is positive, for instance. Um, we also kind of, uh, in the uh, example that I just gave you, uh, sort of the extrapolation error was just bounded by M regardless of what the pretrend looks like, but you can allow the extrapolation error to depend on the magnitude of the pretrend so that say a zero pretrend uh, is more informative. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, we sort of develop an econometric framework that allows for a uh, sort of large class of restrictions. Uh, that include you know, things like bounds on the magnitudes as well as you know, patterns like Ashenfelter's dip and so on and so forth. John, can I ask a question? Yeah. Maybe this is a dumb question, but is it possible to like leverage the stuff from the pre-trends package in that first paper to kind of find the, the trends that are most likely and then port that over to like the honest dip and diff and then try and put a little noise on that so you can kind of uh, get an idea of what that what that might look like? Um, so I think, I, first of all, definitely not a stupid question. It's a great question. Um, so I think actually uh, one way of explaining these types of restrictions large delta is that these are actually exactly what you would need to form a power calculation like what I described in the pretrends package. So suppose we said, you know, we want to test for uh, violations of parallel trends. Um, and we want to say, what is our power against violations of parallel trends that would bias our coefficients by more than 10%, say, or, you know, by more than some bound? Well, if I'm not willing to restrict how the pre-period difference in trends relates to the post-period difference in trends, then that power is basically always going to be trivial because the difference in trends could be very close to zero in the pretreatment period, such that I have almost no chance of detecting a significant pretrend, but then the difference could change very wildly in the post-treatment period and produce a ton of bias. And so basically, if you wanna say we have power of say 90% against a difference in trends that would produce a bias of five, then what you have to be willing to do is make some restrictions that basically say, well, how big would the pretrend need to be in order to produce a bias of, you know, five? So how likely would it be to detect it? And so to do kind of formal power analyses, you do have to make some restriction that kind of looks like a large delta. And so the idea of this paper is basically to say, well, if you're going to make those restrictions that allow you to calculate the power of the pretest, Maybe you don't actually have to do the pretest to begin with. You can kind of just exploit those those uh, restrictions in order to sort of get valid inference on the treatment effect. Uh, 
And you can then do sensitivity analysis with respect to those assumptions to say, you know, how much, you know, how, how strong assumptions do we really need uh, in order to draw particular conclusions? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep, thanks. That's a great question. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, great. Uh, so uh, let me just give you a, a little bit of a preview of kind of how we extend this from the simple kind of three period example I just showed you to kind of a more realistic event study type of setting. Uh, so in the paper, we consider a model where we have some vector of event study coefficients beta hat n, which we think is approximately normal uh, with a mean of beta and a uh, covariance of uh, sigma n. And we sort of divide this vector of coefficients into pretreatment uh, and post-treatment uh, components. And we're gonna assume that the mean of beta hat beta uh, can be decomposed into two terms, a treatment effect tau, and then a bias from trend uh, delta. And we're gonna assume again that there's no actual causal effect in the pretreatment period. So tau pre is gonna be equal to zero. Uh, and that lets us identify the uh, pretreatment difference in trends, but not the uh, sort of counterfactual post-treatment difference in trends. Uh, and so the basic idea is going to parallel the simple example that I showed you. So we're going to be interested in some target parameter, which for simplicity, we're going to treat as a scalar, uh, which is some linear combination of this vector of post-treatment effects. Uh, so this, for instance, could be the effect for a single post-treatment period or say the average across all post-treatment periods. Uh, and what the research is gonna do is specify a set of possible uh, differences in trends, uh, large delta, which intuitively is gonna restrict how delta pre uh, relates to uh, delta post. Uh, and then under this restriction, uh, if I knew the true uh, beta, so I didn't have any estimation error, uh, this would uh, typically allow me to obtain bounds on uh, the treatment effect, uh, estimate. So even if I had infinite uh, data, I wouldn't know uh, theta exactly. But depending on the restrictions that I imposed, I could often obtain somewhat tight uh, bounds on theta. So this is what's called a uh, set identification. Uh, and then formally, uh, the identified set is basically going to be the set of values theta that are consistent with the particular value of theta uh, and uh, the restriction that little delta uh, is in delta. So this is a bit of an ugly notation, but it basically says all the values of theta such that there's some difference in trends that we've allowed uh, that kind of uh, enables uh, this value theta to be the, the true treatment effect that's consistent with uh, the mean of the event study coefficients. Now, can I ask another question? Yep, go for it. Um... So the, the target parameter theta, should we be thinking about specifying an L that's, I mean, roughly corresponding to the way that, say, the Brantley, or sorry, that the, the Brantley Calloway and uh, Pedro Santana paper is providing their different, uh, their different estimates? So, so something like this? Uh, yeah, so that's one option. I mean, you can always kind of do it like different Ls. So one L corresponding with the first period, one L corresponding with the second period, and so on and so forth. Right. Um, one thing that I think is nice about this framework, so uh, is we just require that you have some beta hat n that's approximately normally distributed asymptotically. And so that applies to many different estimators, right? So like two-way fixed effects will get you that. Maybe that's not what you want because you want to be robust to heterogeneity. You know, Callaway and Santana will get you a, an estimator that's asymptotically normally distributed. You know, Sun and Abraham have an alternative, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, things like um, uh, they're the Freyalden, Hoven, Hansen, and Shapiro have this like IV type of thing uh, that is asymptotically normal. So basically, uh, this type of sensitivity analysis can be applied in any case where you have an estimator that's sort of asymptotically normally distributed with some post-treatment type of thing and some pre-treatment type of thing. Um, of course, exactly what the restrictions delta and delta mean will depend on the estimator you're using, right? So if you're using uh, Pedro's estimator, you know, his pretreatment thing is like, uh, sorry, Pedro Santana, if you're using the Cali and Santana type of estimator, then like, um, you know, the pretreatment coefficients are going to be basically be weighted, some weighted averages of differences for groups before they were treated relative to some groups who hadn't yet been treated. And so, 
you know, basically the delta that you impose is sort of relating those weighted averages to the corresponding post-treatment weighted averages. Whereas like for the Freyaldenhoven et al. paper, they have some type of like IV exclusion restriction. So your large delta is going to be relating the sort of possible values of the violation of exclusion in the pretreatment relative to the violations of exclusion in the post-treatment. Um, so, you know, we sort of set it up in this slightly abstract way, uh, precisely so that we can try and cover these different estimation methods. Uh, but the, you know, as you highlighted, the interpretation exactly of theta uh, and also the interpretation of large delta is going to depend on uh, kind of exactly the, the estimator that you're applying this for. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Yeah, great question. Any other question here? Cool. Uh, so uh, what can we do in this framework? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to derive uh, confidence sets that have correct coverage uh, formally in the sense that we cover the parameter of interest at least 1 minus alpha fraction of the time, regardless of what the difference in trends delta is so long as it's in uh, large delta. And so no matter what the, the uh, treatment effect uh, estimate is, so it's probably stated more intuitively, this means that if the actual difference in trends, little delta is in the imposed large delta, then we're guaranteed to have the, the true parameter fall in our confidence interval at least one minus alpha fraction of the time. Cool. Um, how am I doing on time, Taylor? No, I think you're, I think you're good. I mean. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So just take as long as you want, and then uh, we can do the, uh, the the coding session kind of kind of after. Unless you have some specific coding examples you're gonna you're gonna do. No. So I have I basically uh, have you know two vignettes for the the two packages yeah. that kind of walk through an example, uh, which I've kind of you know shown you screenshots basically what the examples look like. So I think. Yeah. You know, unless you had other things in mind, probably walking through those vignettes makes a lot of sense. And I, you know, I'm not sure I have much to tell you about the coding beyond kind of the what's in the in there. So, yeah, walking through uh, that's the plan for me, anyways. <laughs> so, perfect. If we don't get to it, then it should be pretty straightforward for everyone to to go through those on their own. So. Great. Um, okay. So, um, let me just actually take a straw poll. Are people interested? I have one slide here to kind of dig slightly into the black box of kind of one of the ways that we can construct these robust confidence intervals. I, uh, are people interested in seeing that or would people rather I just jump straight to kind of the applications of how you can use this? I think probably that means that you can, you can jump to the application. <laughs> All right, no, one, no one's jumping at the bit. So it's in the paper, great. Uh, so uh, let me actually just talk briefly kind of about a, a recipe for practice about how you can use this. And then uh, I'll sort of show you two, uh, two cooked examples, I guess you could say, uh, of the recipe. Uh, so um, yeah, so basically uh, the first uh, uh, step is what you're probably already doing, which is estimate an event study specification where you have some dynamic estimates for pretreatment and post-treatment periods, and you think your specification has a causal interpretation uh, sort of under a parallel chance assumption. Uh, so as I mentioned briefly to Taylor, you know, this covers OLS event studies, but it also covers Callaway and Santana or Sun and Abraham or Frey Aldenhoven et al. Or, you know, some of this stuff, like older stuff by Alberto Abadi looking at like, conditional parallel trends assumptions and, and anything like that. Um, so uh, then kind of step two, which is what's new here, uh, is to report confidence sets under different assumptions about the set of possible differences in trends large delta. So under different assumptions about, say, how the pretreatment coefficients relate to uh, the post-treatment coefficients. So to give you a, a, a um, concrete example, recall I introduced this set delta SD and M which bounds the change in the slope of, tr of the trend by M. So how much can we deviate uh, from a linear trend? We're going to bound that by M. So you could show as a sensitivity analysis, how do our confidence sets change under different assumptions uh, about M? And you can kind of invert this sensitivity analysis and say, well, uh, say we want to rule out that the treatment effect is zero. Uh, at what value of M 
uh, do we sort of do our conclusions break down such that we can no longer reject this null hypothesis of interest? So how wiggly and nonlinear would that difference in trends have to be such that uh, we can't reject our null hypothesis of interest? Uh, and then kind of, I think the last part that I'd encourage researchers to do is not just show this sensitivity analysis, but try and think about some economic benchmarks for evaluating the different choices of, of Delta. So think about, you know, what would the magnitudes of the potential confounds have to be to rationalize a particular pattern of differences in trends. As I mentioned, we have that, you know, honest DID package for easy and fast implementation. Uh, so let me just walk you through an example. Um, based on this paper by Lovenheim and Willen. Uh, so they're gonna study laws that strengthen teachers unions uh, when someone's a child in school, and then think about how that affects their labor market outcomes uh, in adulthood. Uh, and so uh, they're gonna use a fairly standard or standard at the time they wrote this paper to a fixed effects event study model. Uh, you could redo this with the you know, Callaway and Santana estimator uh, if you wanted to, and then you know, do sensitivity analysis on top of that, but I'm just gonna take the original estimates uh, in the paper and, and do sensitivity on top of those. Uh, and, you know, you can think of this as being valid uh, in this context, if sort of, since they have a dynamic specification, uh, if uh, co all cohorts have sort of the same dynamic pattern of treatment effects relative to when they were first treated. Um, so uh, they're gonna do uh, these event studies uh, separately by male employment and female employment uh, so for male employment, uh, their pretrends are, are statistically insignificant. And then, you know, if you get far enough out, they find significant uh, post-treatment effects. Whereas for female employment, uh, this is actually the, the graph that I showed you earlier, where they do detect a significant pretrend. And so they basically focus only on these results for male employment and don't focus on female because the pretrends kind of illustrate that there may be some problems with this female specification. So I think this is kind of a nice example where we can both sort of think about, well, you know, how robust are these uh, male employment results to potential violations of parallel trends, as well as say, well, look, we detected a significant pretrend here, but under, you know, what assumptions about how smooth this trend is and how it would have continued, can we actually learn something about female employment? Um, so uh, here is a kind of a sensitivity analysis plot uh, along the lines of what I described in, in the recipe slide uh, before. So uh, let me describe to you uh, what this is. So we're gonna think about male employment. We're gonna think about the treatment effect after 15 periods of exposure, which is roughly speaking, having this law that strengthens the teachers, unit, uh, teachers unions in place for the entire time uh, that you're in school as a child. Uh, and we're gonna think about this approximately linear class delta SD of M, that bounds how much the slope of the, the differential change, how much the slope of the differential trend can change uh, in the consecutive periods by this constant M. So all the way on the left here, we have the confidence interval from the original OLS specification uh, in uh, blue. And then in red, we have these uh, robust confidence intervals uh, under the restriction that the difference in trends uh, uh, can have a slope that changes by no more than M uh, across consecutive periods for different values of M. So uh, when we impose M equals zero, we're basically saying there can be violations of parallel trends, but they have to be exactly linear. When we increase M, we're allowing for more and more nonlinearity uh, in the differences in trends. Uh, and so if we start out with OLS, uh, we get a uh, sort of significant uh, coefficient. Uh, so their confidence intervals only include uh, uh, values less than zero. And likewise, if we allow for only linear trends, we get something that looks fairly similar. But as we allow for more and more nonlinearity, we get wider and wider uh, robust confidence intervals. And um, uh, we sort of have a breakdown value if we're interested in a significant effect of about 0 0.01. So the slope of this trend can change by no more than 0 0.01 across consecutive periods if we want to rule out uh, a, uh, uh, you know, zero effect. Uh, so uh, I'll tell you in a minute a little bit more about what 0 0.01 uh, means, but let me first just show you uh, the same results uh, for women. So if we just look at the OLS estimates for women, we get a negative 
uh, you know, confidence interval that only includes negative values again. But uh, if we impose exactly linear trends, uh, we actually get something that looks very different. And the reason, of course, is this downward pretrend. So if we impose exact uh, linearity, we basically can only rationalize something that looks like this that's downward sloping. And by the time we get to period 15, it turns out actually that this linear extrapolation is going to be below this confidence interval uh, for uh, period 15. Uh, and so when we impose exact linearity uh, in the female specification, we actually get a confidence interval that only includes uh, positive treatment effects. Uh, but of course, as we allow for more nonlinearity, our confidence intervals tend to get wider. Uh, and lo and behold, we actually have a breakdown value of uh, approximately 0 0.01, which is basically the same breakdown value as we had uh, for men. So if we're willing to kind of put the same restrictions on the differences in trends for men as we were for women, then we could either impose that the differences in trends have to be approximately linear, in which case we'd get significant negative effects for men, but significant positive effects for women, or we could allow for more nonlinearity, in which case you know, we can kind of reconcile the differential effects for men and women, but we would sort of have can't rule out zero uh, for either group. So, I two, uh, sorry, I just have two questions, yeah. John. Um, the first one is, uh, I guess, one's a two part. So, this, when you have tau sub 15, this is the, the coefficient for the point estimate just for 15, not the entire post treatment period up to 15, right? That we're talking That's about right. This? So, so you okay. could do it for up to 15 as well. So, you, the, you know, yeah. the average is accommodated in the framework, but the result I'm showing for you here yeah. is just tau 15. So, that was one of the kind of the main parameters they have in the paper, like they have a column with period 10, period yeah. 15, and then like the total average. So we just kind of ran with 15. Yeah. yeah. So then the, the follow up to that is, would you recommend having like a plot where you're doing this for each of those post-treatment periods and then having like a series where you have each of these plotted by the M's, if you, if you know what I mean? Like, so on your X axis, you have the year and then um, you have a legend with like the different values of M for the different colors and you have those point, those, those standard errors that you have, would you recommend something like that? Or are you, are you thinking just pick a, a point estimate where you're maybe not at the end of your sample because we know maybe some weird funky things happen towards the end uh, of those estimates, pick something where enough time has passed and then show me this. Is that kind of what we're talking about here? Yeah, so I mean, I think, um... This is slightly a cop-out answer, so apologies in advance. <laughs> but I mean, I think you know the appropriate thing to present obviously is going to be somewhat paper dependent. Uh, right. I mean, you know, in Lovenheim and Willen, they have 22 post-treatment periods, so you know, appendices to econ papers tend to be pretty long. But like to show yeah. a plot like this for you know 22 different periods is probably you know a little bit overkill. Uh, yeah. Right. But so, but I guess I, 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 you know, I think broadly speaking, it's good to show sensitivity analysis for parameters that are most relevant to your analysis. So, yeah. you know, if you really care about the effect after 15 periods, which is like, you know, in this context, roughly corresponds to the whole time you're in school, uh, that seems like a reasonable thing to do. If you're pretty indifferent about period 15 versus 17 versus four, you know, uh, maybe it makes sense to do some sort of averaging. So you could show the, uh, you know, a sensitivity analysis for the average between period zero and five, between five and 10 and 10 and 15, you know, you could probably fit that onto kind of, you know, one page. Um, the, the other way you can do it is if in, instead of kind of showing how the, the confidence uh, sets fan out, you could, if you're interested in a particular null, like you're interested in zero, you could show the breakdown M for, you know, say different like points on the event study. So like for here, for men, it's about 0 0.01 and actually it was about the same for women at period 15, but for period 10, it would be something different. So you could have one plot that kind of shows the, uh, you know, kind of breakdown M at different event times or something like that. Yeah. Awesome. And then the cool. other question was, um, you maybe talk about like how relevant you think this would be if you say you wanted to use men and women and you had a policy that affected women, but uh, not men and you wanted to see how you, how appropriate it would be to consider men as a, as a, like another difference to make a, a, a triple diff, for example. 
with this kind, if you go back to slide like 28, if you had this kind of break, kind of breakdown, but using your uh, thing or using what you're, you're talking about, do you think that's, is that, would you use that to, to try and see how valid the men would be for a, for a, a triple diff? Like imagine that you just shifted all the post event up to zero and thought, hmm, well, this looks pretty good. Do you think that your tool has usefulness there as well? Hmm. So I, I'll have to think more about the, like, should you use this for a triple diff aspect? That's a good question, but I, to be honest, I haven't thought a lot about. Uh, but I think a related idea that we have thought a little bit about uh, is there's, of course, this question of how do you uh, calibrate M, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, you know, breakdown of M is 0 0.01, and, you know, that's great. But, like, if I don't know what 0 0.01 means, like, I might as well tell you the breakdown of M is, like, four widgets. And you're like, okay, <laughs> well, like, you know, like, it doesn't mean much to me. Um, and, you know, that, that I think is, to, to be perfectly upfront, like, I think, you know, one of the hardest parts about the sensitivity analysis is figuring out, like, how do we calibrate the M? Uh, but one thing that we have thought about uh, is something along the lines that you suggested, where we have some group that we know isn't really affected, but we think is kind of in other ways possibly similar. You can potentially use the observed differences for that group as a way of sort of calibrating M. So, you know, if you had data from, you know, a different state or something like that, you know, you could basically, you can, from the data, you can say, what is the largest nonlinearity for that group? And then you can kind of benchmark the M here relative to sort of the, you know, say the maximal nonlinearity or upper bound on the maximal nonlinearity that we've observed from some other group, which I think is a sort of similar idea as to kind of what, what you were suggesting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks, John. Great, yeah, any other questions? Uh, so, uh, I guess following up on, on that response to Taylor, uh, you know, I think it's, it's useful to try and put units on M, uh, and kind of, you know, one way we thought about doing that in this example is basically trying to benchmark relative to knowledge about possible confounds. So in this context, uh, one thing we're worried about is that maybe there are differential trends in education quality, even absent these laws that may lead to, you know, non-parallel trends between the types of states that passed these laws and the types of states that didn't. Uh, and so one thought exercise that we can do is like, suppose this were the mechanism, what does M imply say about the differential evolution of teacher quality if we thought that was the thing that was driving this. Uh, and so uh, you know, we have these estimates from the literature as to how teacher value added uh, impacts uh, the, our outcome here, which is like uh, the uh, employment in adulthood. And so we can kind of translate these breakdown values of M into uh, sort of uh, units of, well, how much would sort of the trend in uh, teacher quality uh, between periods have to change uh, in order uh, for us to get a particular value of M. So right here, uh, you know, M equals 0 0.01, which is the breakdown corresponds roughly with the change uh, in the trend of, or the differential trend of teacher quality of about uh, two and a half percent of a standard deviation of teacher value added. Um, and so then uh, I think the, the final thing I'll show you and then uh, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, is uh, that uh, you can sort of incorporate shape and sign restrictions that are motivated by economic knowledge. So uh, Love and Hyman Willen argue that the pre-trends for men likely arise from secular changes in women's educational and labor market outcomes. If we think these are sort of long run ongoing processes, it might be reasonable uh, to sort of impose monotonicity of the trends. Uh, and if we do this for women, this can wind up being very informative because we sort of have this downward sloping tread and that lets us to basically get a lower bound on uh, what the uh, effects for women can be. So even if we allow for sort of very nonlinear trends for imposing monotonicity, we basically almost never get lower bounds that are much lower uh, than the OLS lower bounds. So uh, I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the second application that we have in the paper, although I invite you to, to, to check it out. Uh, and uh, so uh, let me uh, then just wrap up. Uh, or actually, let me pause first and see if there are any questions before I wrap up. Great. Um, so 
uh, I guess to wrap up, uh, you know, in difference and differences context, we're often worried that the parallel trends assumption may not hold uh, exactly in our context. Uh, and tests of pretrends are sort of an intuitive way of uh, gauging the plausibility of the parallel trends assumption. But as I've shown you today, they're uh, sort of not a, a panacea. Uh, so they have some limitations in terms of power and uh, distortions from pretesting. And it's also not exactly clear what we do uh, if we uh, fail uh, the pretest. I see that Nina has a, a hand raised. Nina, do you want to ask a question? Yes, I was going to wait until you'd wrapped up, but I just I thought I'd, I'd signal um, that, that there was a question uh, in any case. Um, so, so my question is really more about practical advice um, than, than anything else. Um, so I'm kind of wondering about if you have um, a setup of like an event study um, where there's not really a clear pretreatment trend, um, but you have, you know, you do have large statistically significant differences between the control and treatment groups, but they kind of, you know, go all over the place. Um, what is kind of like what kind of concrete information does that give us that we can then you know use to set the the parameter of interest like if we're using the honest bid um for, for instance and apologies if i you know completely mis misinterpreted something no not at all um so i mean i guess uh maybe to just to preview a little bit. So I, I said I wouldn't go into our second application, but I think this may sort of address your question. So here's kind of the event plot in our second application. Uh, and you know the, the pre-trends look pretty good, although you can actually rule out that all of them are, are exactly equal to zero because we have this one significant you know, coefficient here and corresponding with 2007. Uh, but it looks like there's sort of a pretty sharp break around the time of the, the treatment here. Uh, and so basically, what we can do basically by applying this formal analysis is basically say, well, how jumpy would this difference in trends have to be such that we could, you know, say rationalize uh, this, this pattern if there were no effect. And it turns out that that thing has to be very jumpy. So here the outcome is like log restaurant profits. And so like the trends in restaurant profits have to be able to change by like more than, I think it's like 22% or something in consecutive years in order to rationalize this. So it kind of gives you a, a way of sort of saying, you know, how robust to differences in trends does the, um, uh, you know, would, sorry, how robust to, to differences in trends sort of is the significant effect, uh, you know, how perhaps implausibly jumpy would the differences have to be to, to sort of rationalize something. And, and I, I would also like to recommend that, you know, zero is not the only interesting null of interest, right? And so sometimes like for a cost benefit analysis, we care not about zero, but that the effect is like 2000. And so, you know, that things may be very relevant there. Uh, and uh, the one other thing I'll say to that is that, uh, you know, I think these tools are super useful when you do have, you know, a, a, a clear pretrend, but, you know, as we saw in like that he and Wong example, there wasn't an obvious pretrend, but we still might be worried kind of about what the things that we didn't have much power to detect are. So I do think there's there's value in these tools, kind of even in cases where we don't detect a significant pretrend. So I was rambling a little bit, but I hope that answered your question at least a little bit. Great, thank you. Great. Any other questions? Uh, just a quick follow up and on that. So if you did get that, how jumpy you'd have to be, and you said, okay, here has got to be 22% change between consecutive periods. Would you then go, okay, now here's what we've observed in the in the actual pre-period and like that never shows up or it shows up one set. Of, so like, it's not really that likely that this is actually going to be a thing if that's what the next step would be given that kind of information. Yeah, so that, you, you nailed what we did in the paper. So <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, so yeah, so uh, I guess, you know, just to wrap up, uh, you know, uh, I've argued that tests of pretrends are intuitive, but they're not a panacea. They can't detect everything, uh, and you know we can't just fully rely on them. Uh, and so I described two papers that provide tools for kind of diagnostics uh, and sensitivity analyses. Uh, and then I think that the note I want to conclude on is that I think when using these tools, it's important to incorporate context-specific knowledge. Um, so you know. Uh, in the sort of first approach where you do diagnostics, you have to have some hypothesis trend that you think about sort of power against. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
rather than just say it has to be linear, it's good to think about, well, how might parallel trends uh, be violated uh, in your context? And likewise, in uh, you know, the second approach, you do have to you know, sort of impose some restrictions about how the pre-treatment -pre -pre periods relate to the post-treatment periods. Uh, and you know, on the one hand, I think that makes people nervous because we like just running tests. But on the other hand, I think we should like this because you know, uh, I like to say we're putting the econ back into econometrics. And that you know, we often do have a lot of context-specific knowledge about what's going on in our context and you know, what are the likely ways that things might be different between our treated and comparison groups. Uh, and I think, or at least I hope, that kind of the tools we've developed here let you kind of bring some of that economic knowledge back into the econometrics you're doing rather than kind of just looking at a black box statistical test and saying P is greater than 0 0.05 in the pre-period. So, you know, we're good to go. Um, so uh, uh, unless there are any questions, like I'll kind of leave you with that. Uh, I can share with Taylor the slides and I put in here uh, in the last slide kind of links to all the papers and the associated packages and some of the documentation. So. Uh, Thanks again for uh, having me out here to talk about my research and uh, I hope this is helpful. Thanks very much, John. We'll uh, have a few minutes for all the questions. Oh, wow, lots. That's great. Um, so I will just ask one quick thing before, is there any um, intention to add the Honesty ID stuff into the staggered package uh, for those of us, or? For, for those who are using who are using Stata, I mean, I guess you can figure how to use Rcall yourself in, in Stata, but just uh, out of curiosity. Um, so uh, we may eventually write an Rcall package to try and call Honesty ID within R, uh, sorry, from within Stata. So call R to call Honesty ID within Stata. Um, you know, we we were able with with some difficulty to get, try and get the staggered package to work in Stata. Um, this package is slightly more complicated, so uh, it's it's on the agenda. But uh, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever developed in Stata, but it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, if anyone is interested in doing that, uh, I would be very happy to, uh, you know, use some research money to hire an RA to to kind of work on this. So if if there's anyone who's interested in uh, doing this, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll have that soon, but I, I can't make any promises. The good news is that the R package is very easy to use. So even if you do the estimation in Stata, you can just export that and put it into R and, and call and do everything. And it's very, very straightforward and, and simple. So uh, that's, the, that's the good news. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks for, for flagging that. Yeah, so, so. It is worth flagging that you can do basically all your estimation in Stata, and then you just need a, a variance matrix and a coefficients to do the, the honest TID stuff. Um, and uh, for the for the pretrins package, I do have a shiny app. So if you if you sort of religiously refuse to open R, you can actually use the shiny app to sort of make the same types of plots. So awesome! Uh, open it up to uh, to any questions that that people have. I'll let whichever ones you want to answer, John. Oh, uh, are people raising their hands? I I have the video, but I don't see the. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, uh, there are a few. So I think just um, I guess go ahead and uh, and just ask ask your questions straight up. Whoever uh, whoever has the has the questions, and we'll organize it that way. I think Akash has. All right, his... thank you. Oh, I have a question then. Would you say that there's like a, a tipping point where it will be like uh, more useful to go for um, synthetic control instead of testing on on the on pretrends? Like getting very very messy with with that M and how how linear or not linear the trend is, and just like uh, leaving it and, and going directly through something in the in the lines of Ben Ali and co-authors or something like that. Yeah, that's a great, this is a great question um, regarding synthetic controls. Um, so, I mean, uh, I guess to phrase this delicately, this sort of uh, synthetic controls and difference in differences literatures have evolved somewhat independently of each other. Um, and I think 
sort of the econometric framework for synthetic controls uh, in terms of doing inference, so confidence intervals and hypothesis testing, is still being worked out a little bit. Um, so you know, people do stuff with placebo tests, but then there are also a variety of different methods for constructing confidence intervals. Uh, but often inference is difficult because you like synthetic controls often deals with the cases where you have sort of uh, very few treated units, so that you know, like the diff and diff type confidence intervals won't be valid. Uh, so I, I think, um, you know, I think there's still more econometric work to be done on kind of guidance of when you should use diff and diff type methods versus when you should use synthetic controls. I would, and the kind of existing results make them somewhat hard to compare uh, in some sense, though there are, you know, some recent papers trying to bridge those gaps. Um, but I guess if I can provide any kind of concrete guidance is that, uh, Diff and diff often works well, at least in theory, in settings where you have many treated and comparison units, but relatively few time periods. Whereas a lot of the results for synthetic controls are in settings where you have like uh, a longer panel, but potentially few uh, treated units. Uh, and so uh, I guess, um, yeah, that's that's primarily what I sort of, you know, have to stay on that, but I think it's a great question for sort of future econometric research on exactly which of these panel data methods you want to be using and, and when. That was really useful, thank you. Hey, Jonathan, can you hear me? Yep. Cool, thank you. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the figure that you have with the red and blue and the green dots, uh, just based on that. Uh, one uh, one aspect I had was that it, it's based on the uh, the stand, standard errors of your estimates of your pre-trend. So uh, unless we are confident about we, if we have S, uh, if our standard errors are estimated correctly, we can go ahead with what we've observed. And it and I'm linking it to what Bruno Furman's paper is recently saying: is if you're actually uh, assessing a valid inference on your on your beta parameters. Uh, based if you're clustering or not, if you are uh, using just your, you know, heteroscedasticity uh, corrected standard errors or something of that sort. So I was wondering, based on that, would it be possible if we use something like, like drop one observation and see where your betas uh, fluctuate between those and then map them out to see what your bounds are on that. If you keep dropping one, one observation and run it again and again and again. Um, so just to make sure I understand the question. So are you asking about, you know, what happens if our standard errors might be wrong because there's like some macro shock or something like that, that we're not accounting for? Is that, was, is that the gist of the question? I, I guess I, maybe one I aspect of that. And the other aspect was like, if you want to know the plus and minus M, would one approach be appropriate to like drop one observation and see where your, uh, deltas map out to and see. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. Uh, so I guess the two components, so uh, let me address the second one first. So um, I guess uh, I think it's, it may be worth highlighting that like in some sense, M can't be estimated from the data, even if you had infinite data, because M is putting a bound on how much could the counterfactual difference of trends had changed. Right, so unless we somehow magically could get data on what would have happened in the counterfactual, which would solve a lot of our problems, but uh, unless we can get that, then we can't really say what would happen uh, in the um, what would have happened in the counterfactual. Uh, we may be willing to impose a different assumption, which is what would have happened under the counterfactual was not too different from what we observed in pretreatment periods, uh, in which case you can estimate. You sort of the maximal nonlinearity or the maximal you know bias of difference and differences in pretreatment periods, uh, and you know what you suggested with the boot like a jackknife type of thing where you you leave one out is would be one way of kind of doing inference there. Uh, we discussed some others uh, in the paper. Um, so if you're willing to sort of bound post-treatment bias by some function of pretreatment bias, uh, possibly after some you know detrending or something. Then you can certainly do that. That's sort of like a, a type of, of large delta that, that one can use. Uh, but I think important to highlight that you know there's a hidden assumption there that the post-treatment would not have looked too different from the pre-treatment, which depending on the type of endogeneity you're thinking about could be, you know, 
true and could be not. Uh, you know, if our outcome is COVID cases and our pretreatment data is from 2019, you know, probably the, the pretreatment's pretty flat, but it may not tell us very much about, you know, sort of what would have happened in 2020 and 2021. So, you know, I think it's worth highlighting that there are some cases where the pretreatment is not very informative about the post-treatment, um, but under those types of assumptions, yeah. Uh, the second component, I think, was about um, well, if there are kind of macro shocks, say, then our standard errors may not be right. Um, so uh, if you sort of condition on what the realization of the macro shocks are, then you can sort of think of that as a delta, so a difference in trends, kind of conditional on that shocks, the expectation of, the, say, pretreatment coefficients is non-zero. And so you could think about, like, rather than a parametric type of like linear assumption, you could think about power against um, uh, sort of jumpy types of uh, uh, parallel violations of parallel trends, like say, like you know, some type of um, some type of uh, you know thing, say, drawn from a normal distribution in an AR one or something like that. Um, I have in the appendix to my paper on pretrends testing. Uh, I have some simulations under these like statistic violations of parallel trends uh, that suggest kind of similar issues with pretesting there. Uh, and uh, Bruno now I think has, Bruno Furman has some simulations of a similar elk in one of his papers. Thank you. Okay, any, any other questions for John? All right. Well, thank you very much, John, for for the uh, for the coming on the presentation and two pr papers for the price of one. So that's that's even better. Um, yeah. That, so th thank you, thank you very much. I'm sure that uh, if it was in person, we'd have some some great applause. But uh, unfortunately, digitally, that's not quite quite possible. So at this point, I think that we will jump into. Some, some coding. I'm just going to kind of go through the, the vignette for the honest DID. And uh, if you have time to, to join and you want to, then that's cool. If not, totally understand. And we'll see you guys next week for the, uh, for the next meeting of uh, Pedro Santana's paper with uh, Brantley Callaway on, uh, on stagger timing. So thanks again, John. We really awesome. appreciate well, it. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, if you wind up using this stuff, uh, feel free to, to shoot me an email if you're having any either conceptual or, you know, state or art gives you an error. So thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks a lot.